Hello, Internet. My name is Quentin, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm working on the Eccentric Engineering Acute Tool Sharpening System this week. I think we're in the short rows on this one. We've got just a few more parts to make, and then we'll finally be able to give this thing a whirl. It should be cool. Let's go. Here's where we left our tool sharpener system. We got the sliding workhead done. It runs on this track thingamajig. Now, the next piece to make is this. It's a stop for the workhead. The kit includes this partially finished piece. So as is typical with this kit, we need to start by figuring out what's actually finished and what isn't. So I'm checking the diameter of the through hole in the counter bore, and there's a radius around the outside of this block that I might have to machine, and it looks like I do. But the thickness also needs machining, so let's do that first. The block is over length overall. It's not always clear in this kit why some pieces are finished to the point that they are already in the kit and why they're finished less so in other cases. Some pieces are supplied completely finished, some are partially finished like this one, some are unfinished and you have to make everything from scratch from the drawings, and the pieces that are partially finished seem to vary a lot in which features they provide you finished and which they don't. And sometimes features look finished, but they're actually not, so you gotta check everything first, which is a bit different than other kits. The first real feature I'm going to make then is a cross hole through this block. The drawing references it from this corner, so I'll edge find on that corner and reference from here for my drilling. I'm going to center drill that and drill this all the way through. This is a threaded hole for a fine adjust on the stop block. So you can slide the block on that track that we saw at the top of the show, and then there's a little thumb screw in here that lets you make finer adjustments. So this has a series of concentric holes in it. I start by going all the way through with the tap drill because the bottom part of the hole is tapped. Then I drill out the upper portion with a clearance drill because we don't need the whole thing to be threaded. And then finally I do a big counter bore with a larger drill, and this will receive the end of the brass knob that's on the fine adjust screw. That's all looking good. You can see the counter bore gets close to the radius there, but by doing it now we don't have to mill a flat spot before drilling that. We still had enough real estate to do that. And finally I tap those threads at the bottom. Now if you watched the previous videos in this series, you know that the last time we made a little lead screw type thing, there was a cross hole that met up with it that held a little piece of nylon that acts as a friction and a lock. This has the same feature, so I rotated the block and edge found again on X. I still have the same Y reference, so that's fine. This hole has a different reference corner than the other one does, so I could have used an end stop, but I didn't really trust the dimensions of the block to be perfect, and I just decided to edge find it to be safe. But this gets drilled in a T formation directly into the other cross hole that we drilled. And then this gets tapped to a specific depth, hence the tape flag. And then I gotta tap it once again with a bottoming tap to make sure I have full threads down to the depth specified in the drawing. There we go, there's those two threaded cross holes meeting up in the middle. Over to the lathe now to turn the rounded outer profile of this block. I'm gonna do that with a mandrel. I found this piece of scrap that's conveniently already quite mandrel shaped. Just needs a little bit of modification to be used. I have a million pieces of scrap like this in my offcuts bins. I have no idea what this is from, but it's got a bunch of detritus on the end. Looks like the remnants of some hole that was drilled in some other part. So I'll face all of that down, as is tradition. Next, I'll square up this shoulder. There's quite a large radius and an angled surface on that shoulder. Once again, no idea what this part was from, but it's going to be a mandrel now. And once I get that turned down to a diameter that fits in the larger counter bore on the block, then I turned down the area below that to fit through the smaller through hole. And the larger diameter I made sure is shorter than the counter bore so that it won't interfere, and the block will definitely sit up against the square shoulder at the back of my mandrel. A little test fit to make sure I did that right. And that looks good. The block sits tight on my shoulder. Now I'm going to thread the end of it there to clamp the block to the mandrel. So I mark where the end of the block goes, and then I'll turn down a little bit more than that for threading. I want to make sure that there's threads past the edge of the block to make sure that the nut can tighten all the way down against the block and not bottom out on the threads. I'm not using my tailstock die holder here because this is a metric thread and my metric dies are eh, kind of a cheapo mechanic set that don't fit in my tailstock die holder. So I had to do it the clumsy way with the die stock, but eh, got it done. That looks like that's going to work. I'll attach that now with a little washer and a nut. Snug that down, and we are ready to turn the OD of this block. 
Don't actually know why the drawing specifies a rounded outer profile on this block. I think it's just decorative. I don't see any particular function for this radius, but it does look nice and it's a fun excuse to do a little bit of interrupted turning on the lathe. I'll check the sort of pseudo diameter that we have here so far, make sure I'm matching the drawing. Didn't have much to remove there, one cut should do it. And survey says, yep, yeah, that looks good. Now I'll chamfer the corners because of course chamfers are what separate us from the animals. Now this chamfer is only going to hit the tops of the radii that we just turned. So we still have to chamfer the straight sections between those corners, but that's a good start. So for the straight sections, eh, we could get fancy and set this up on the mill and do eh. We could get fancy and set this up on the mill and do a whole bunch of, you know, math to figure out where to put the chamfers, or I could just take it over to the belt sander and match it up by eye. So that's what I did. I'm 99.99% sure this chamfer is entirely cosmetic. In fact, I believe those corner radii are cosmetic as well, so I can't see any reason from the drawings not to just do this by eye. I did my best to match the corner chamfers that were done with the tool with the belt sander on the straight edges, and yeah, it's not perfect, but I think I did reasonably well on that. Looks good from 100 yards anyway. One more feature to do back on the mill. The underside of this block needs a little tenon, I guess, for lack of a better machinist term for it that slides in that track that you saw at the top of the show. So I will machine this centered on the bottom of the block. I line up one edge with where the drawing says it should be, and then the opposite edge, I sneak up on it, test fitting with the track as I go so that I end up with something that's well centered, but also slides nicely on the track. That's looking pretty good. Future editor Quinn here, I did actually end up doing a fair bit of fettling on all these parts with needle files as well to make everything move smoothly. Everything is a little bit tight coming right off the machines. As I tend to do, I tend to try to hit the top of the tolerance on everything, and when you do that, everything fits together, but it always ends up a little tight when you're done. It certainly does look nice, though. I'll install the little fine adjust screw next. This is exactly the same as the one you saw me make for the top slide on the workhead. It's a piece of threaded rod that was included in the kit, loctited into a brass knob that was included in the kit. So no fabrication to show you there. But I'll thread that in there, and again, the kit includes this little piece of nylon that goes in the side, and I think acts as friction for the knob and also a stop. And that gets tightened down with a set screw. So there we have the little stop block for the workhead, complete with fine adjust knob. Next up is the tool block. This is kind of like a collet block, but not really, as you'll see. But it holds a collet-like thing that holds the actual tool that we're going to be sharpening. So once again, I have to inspect everything and see what the kit has finished for me and what it has not. In this case, the OD is good and the bore is good, but the overall length of the part is over dimension. So I'll start by shortening that down to the drawings. I'm setting it up square, just with a square. I didn't bother indicating it in vertically. Judging by what I've seen of the how-to videos on how to actually use this thing, the end of this needs to be decently square, but it's not super critical, so I don't want to spend a bunch of time in areas where it's not necessary. If you've watched previous videos in this series, you know I spend a lot of time complaining about how I don't actually know how this thing works. Well, my patrons sent me a bunch of videos from Eccentric Engineering that actually explain how to use this thing, so I do know a fair bit about it now, which is very helpful when manufacturing it, because then you know which tolerances are critical and which are less so once you see how the thing is actually used and how the parts all relate to each other. It was fun not knowing how any of this worked, kind of like building a Lego Technic set where you don't actually know what the final thing is going to be, but uh, it's actually more efficient to know how the final thing is going to work. Next up are some features around the outsides of this block. So you can see here's one of the little kind of collet-like things I talked about. It's sort of like a collet, but it doesn't squeeze the way a collet does but it does hold the tool that you're going to be sharpening, and it indexes 90 degrees, and there's also round and hexagonal ones. So that lets you adjust for the different flutes on whatever you're sharpening. Now there's this groove in the center, and we need a set screw that will lock into that. So I'm going to start by doing that. There's set screw holes on both sides of this block that are aligned, so I'm going to center drill and drill all the way through the block to do both of them at once. Then I'll tap the top hole. Unfortunately, my tap was not long enough to tap them both in one setup, so I used an end stop to flip this over and tap the other side without needing to re-indicate anything. 
mean, that's honestly overkill with the hole drilled. You could tap that free hand on the other side and it would be just fine. But yeah, I'm all set up. I got the end stop. Why not? Now at this point, the collet won't go in because we've got burrs in there from the threading. So I need to deburr the backs of those holes. And for that, I've got this Noga backside deburring tool. Hashtag not sponsored, but I always call these out when I use them because if you don't have a set of these, your life is incomplete. Let me tell you, these solve so many deburring problems that I don't know how you would solve any other way. I mean, there's other ways you could deburr these particular holes, but that tool is really fantastic. Next up, I need some five millimeter shallow blind holes on the sides of this block. These are for a registration pin. Creating a shallow, small blind hole is actually fairly difficult. I'm doing it with a five millimeter end mill because it needs to be a five millimeter diameter, but I actually had to order this end mill to do this. There are other ways you could do it. You could, for example, pre-drill a small hole and then grind a very tiny boring bar and treat it like any other blind hole or counter bore. All of that would be a lot of work. You could also grind a flat drill to do it. I didn't want to sacrifice my only five millimeter drill to do that. So there's other ways you could do it that are a lot more work, but I decided to just order the end mill in this case. The far side of the block requires a five degree angle. So I'm going to do that with an angle block down on top of my parallels. Here's an easy way to cut reasonably accurate tapers. Just blew up the small end of your taper and then make progressive cuts downward until you've got just a tiny wisp of blue left showing on the small end of the taper surface. What that does is ensures that you get the taper covering the entire surface without getting too deep, which is very easy to do by accident, and thus reducing the dimension on the small end of your taper. This is a trick that works great when cutting tapers, for example, for a Morse taper on your lathe, it also works great when grinding tools, like on the D-bit grinder, to make sure you're not getting into your cutting edge too far when you're cutting clearance angles, that kind of thing. This is surprisingly effective and makes what can be very difficult quite easy to do. Now it's not going to be micron perfect, but it's very rare that you need a taper to be that perfect. So for 99.9% .9 of cases, a little bit of Sharpie on the small end is all you need. If you look closely in the center, I don't know if it shows up on camera, but there's just a wisp of blue left. Don't look at the corners, there's extra chamfer there with Sharpie on it. I'm looking at the center. This side also needs a small blind hole that's orthogonal to the surface, so I'm doing it in the same five degree setup. There we go, there's the tapered tool block. It gives us two different angles at which to hold the tool, which are used for grinding different clearances on the final cutter that we're grinding. So that will sit in the tool block slide like so, allows us to go in and out and move around on the workhead. Then the call it block like thing goes in there like so, and it can index around and reach different flutes or edges on the tool that we're grinding. But how do we actually hold a tool in that? It's a solid block. Well, it needs a big hole punched in the middle of it. The kit includes a bunch of these blank call it blocks, if you will, and you drill holes in them to match the various types of tooling that you want to use in the fixture. So in my case, I'm going to start by drilling a 3 8 hole through the center of this, which is going to cover 99% of my end mills. I'll probably make a second one that's half inch and, you know, for various other things, we'll see what I need. But I'll start by centering this up in the four jaw as best I can. Obviously, we want this to be as concentric as we can get it because as we index the cutter around using this block, we want it to stay on center in the fixture. So I'll start by center drilling that and then I'm going to pre-drill it fairly undersized. I'm going to be reaming it, but before I ream it, I'm going to want to go in with a boring bar to make sure that we get good concentricity just in case that drill wandered a little bit. It looks like this drill ran really true, so this probably isn't necessary, but it doesn't hurt. I do happen to have a boring bar small enough to get in there and do it, so might as well. The only complication here is that this boring bar does not have enough reach to get all the way to the bottom of this bore. It's a fairly deep hole all the way through this block. So I went as deep as I could and got the front roughly two thirds of that hole running true. Quick check with a gauge pin to make sure I'm in the ballpark of the pre-drill size for a reamer, which I am. Now, if I stick the normal pre-drill size for the reamer in there, you can see it doesn't go all the way through because I couldn't get all the way in with the boring bar. So now I'm going to go in with that drill, which is a little bit smaller than the bore I just did. So it's not going to cut that bore, but it's going to allow me to drill out the bottom third of that hole that I couldn't reach with the boring bar. And now that bottom third may not be concentric, but it doesn't matter because now when I come in with the reamer, the reamer is going to center up on the top of the hole that we did with the boring bar, and then it's going to maintain that concentricity once it gets down into that bottom third where the hole might be off a little bit. 
and it's going to keep concentricity all the way down and make one nice consistent boron dimension. So there's a little trick if you don't have quite enough reach with your boring bar. If you can get the tool started at the top, it'll stay centered all the way through. I'll do a test fit now with an end mill that I would like to sharpen with this thing, hence the red paint on it, because this one is bad on one end. And that is a perfect fit. Slides in there nicely, but no play. Hopefully concentric, and that should be a good block to hold this tool for sharpening. Then, as I said, the idea is you make more of these blocks for any tool that you want to sharpen. To recap then, we've got this sliding top slide along the top, and then the entire workhead moves back and forth on this track, and then we've got a little sliding stop block there with a fine adjust on it to limit the travel of that workhead horizontally, which is part of grinding the right angles on the tool. Then this entire track assembly is also height and angle adjustable for various clearances on the cutting tools. Then the tool block holding the tool goes on top of that slide, and that can move in and out as needed and back and forth as needed for grinding the tool. I'll slide this tool in there so you can get a sense of how the whole thing works. Now there's lots and lots of details about how this all works, how all of these pieces fit together to grind various different kinds of tools. We're going to get into that very, very soon when this thing is done. I am, as we speak, learning how to use this thing, so soon you will know what I know about it at least. There's just a little bit more work to do before we can give this thing a test drive. But that is all the time I have this week. Sorry for a little bit shorter video. I'm currently battling a shoulder injury, which is really slowing me down a lot, both in the shop and here in the editing booth. But I hope you'll stick with me. Have a little bit of patience while I work through this. One of the many joys of getting up in years. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all of this content possible. And I will see you next time.